It's a widely accepted fact that the mining industry contains some of the most perilous jobs in the career pool. It pays ludicrously well of course but has a notably higher mortality chance to salary ratio when compared to other blue collar work. It's certainly understandable however, from poor air quality to cave-ins, all the way to hitting gas pockets and equipment failure. There's plenty of things in this line of work that are less than accommodating to human life. At the absolute very least, however, these risks are expected. Those that work in the field not only anticipate these risks, but gladly accept them as such when venturing below the surface. Aside from freak accidents, things usually only go wrong in semi-well-documented ways. With that in mind, allow me to paint a picture. Something went wrong and four individuals from a 12-man crew have now perished. The rest are stranded with no foreseeable way to the surface, and yet none of the previously mentioned risks are to blame. In fact, the mine itself or anything naturally forming for that matter isn't to blame either. So, with all of those potential hazards ruled out, for what reason could this have occurred? Whatever you guessed is likely far from reality, and likely not even remotely close. The situation makes absolutely no sense and the explanation will make even less. For that reason, I'll attempt to break everything down as simply as possible from the beginning, but bear with me as certain parts might be rather long-winded. To start, I'm Finnegan, I'm an equipment operator for a coal mining operation run by Riker Energy Resources, a rather newly founded company headquartered in Wyoming. Overall, the job was a phenomenal opportunity. Little to no experience was needed due to the company being notably unestablished in the industry, with the compensation structure only falling slightly below the national average. For somebody fresh out of high school with no plans for college, it was an opportunity too perfect to pass up. After two years with the company, I had gotten into the rhythm of doing my job, and it did particularly well. Factoring in the generally unchanging crew of 11 other individuals that I worked with, we overall functioned like a well-oiled machine. We pride ourselves on that ability to work efficiently, yet we were rather dependent on our routine. However, at the beginning of our shift approximately 12 hours ago, that routine was broken. And if the forces of the universe took notice of this, everything went sideways in very short order. I thought we were on waste removal for the week, I questioned, flipping through the thoroughly stained schedule taped to the window of the managerial office. Y'all lucked out this time. Survey team discovered a sizable load deeper down. Got no extra crews to work on it, so y'all are up for now. Our foreman stated, reviewing the paper himself before retrieving and unfolding an additional piece of paper from his pocket. Look like all of y'all are set to be on shift. I'll just wait by the truck for everybody else to show up. He added, gesturing to the vehicle. I simply nodded and walked over to the truck, leaning on it as I sipped the mug of bitter coffee that I had hurriedly brewed before arriving. Rather promptly, the other 11 members of our worker pool arrived, and we quickly filed into the back of the vehicle. It was little more than an industrial tour bus, and the crew compartment was notably cramped with 12 individuals packed inside. I was seated in the very back row, and a large bearded individual by the name of Angus filled the seat beside me. New plans? That certainly beats shovel and rock for another 12 hours, eh? He commented with a slight chuckle. Still gonna be shovel and rock, bud. At the very least, we get to use the fun tools as well. Margot responded from the middle row. She was likewise an equipment operator, so we often worked interchangeably on the same tasks. Likewise, being the second oldest member of the crew at 55 years old, she was well respected by everybody else. Before anybody else was able to join in, the personnel carrier jolted to life as it began shakily moving down into the depths of the mines. Despite being rather large, all equipment was electrically operated to reduce the risks of fumes accumulating and, as a result, it began picking up speed impressively quickly. Despite our assignment being roughly 500 feet below the surface through various crowded and winding shafts, we were expected to arrive in around 10 minutes. 
Around five minutes into the ride, Angus tapped me on the shoulder and motioned to my coffee mug, which had since become rather cold. I'm gonna finish that, Finn, he politely questioned. I have at it, not the most pleasant brew. I responded, handing him the half-full mug. Thank you, lad, he replied, finishing the remaining beverage alarmingly quickly. Shortly thereafter, the vehicle jolted to a halt as we arrived at the assignment site. It was a dead-end cavern with quickly assembled support beams and lighting systems, giving it the definitive appearance of a work in progress. We exited the vehicle and quickly began, divvying up the work as we always did at the start of a larger task. A gruff, older individual that we simply referred to as Davy took the lead as per usual. He was the oldest individual on the crew, at an astonishing 60 years of age, and had plenty of experience in the industry to back his leadership. After the majority of the crew had been assigned their respective tasks, he pointed in my direction and provided me with my job for the shift as well. Finn and Margo grabbed the drills and hit those markers. Depths should be marked below. He ordered, gesturing to various chalk markings on the nearby cavern wall. Mark, get with Angus and start prepping some charges. All right, everybody, let's have a good day. Break. He added before clapping his hands. Everyone broke out and began working as instructed, with Margot and I making our way across the cavern towards a line of parts utility trucks, with various types of equipment stacked in the back. We grabbed the large handheld drills that we were to be using during the shift, and we lugged them over to the specified wall, powering them up and beginning our task as instructed. Within around an hour, many of the markings had been drilled down to their identified depths, with the remaining being completed 20 minutes thereafter. Angus began filling the completed holes with charges, with all the remaining crew filling into the respective vehicles as we began exiting the potential blast radius. Angus arrived last and revealed a detonator from his pocket, connected to the charges with a sizable length of wire. Shall I do the honors, boss? Angus questioned, removing the protective cover from over the switch. And Davy consulted his radio and after receiving the all clear, responded with a simple thumbs up. Angus flipped the switch as a thundering explosion echoed through the cavern, with the shockwave shortly making its way up with a level of force that shook the vehicles parked beside us. After a few moments, we loaded back into the trucks and once more returned to the site, which now had a sizable hole blown into the cavern wall revealing a notably charged amount of coal winding throughout the inside of the stone. We began surveying the area and once more began our assigned duties. Margo and I retrieved our drills and made our way over to the wall to continue the extraction process. However, before we could make much progress, Margo stopped and placed her drill on the ground. Something wrong, I questioned, doing the same. She appeared fixated on a particular section of the wall, one that was visibly lighter colored than the rest of the nearby stone. Not sure if I'm seeing things, but I think that's concrete. She responded, picking up a nearby hammer and further chipping away at the area. After a few heavy swings, a larger chunk broke off the wall, revealing visible rebar underneath. Well, I'll be damned. Davy, check this out, she added calling Davy over as she continued removing the area surrounding the rebar. Davy arrived and appeared just as astonished at the sight. He retrieved a piece of paper from his jacket, referencing it as he continued glancing at the opening. Shouldn't be anything man-made here. The company has just barely started excavating at this depth. Shouldn't even be anything aside from the mine for the surrounding ten miles, he added. He radioed back up to the surface and after a brief conversation returned looking visibly more confused than he was previously. Looks like it's a new development to management as well. If it seems sound enough, they suggested that we either drill around it or through it. He informed us once more glancing at the opening as he referenced his documents. Why not just set a charge in that spot? Should give us an idea of how deep it goes, and we might still stay on schedule too. Mark suggested, having likewise taken notice of the discovery along with overhearing the conversation. He 
He was relatively new on the crew, having only been there for a few months, along with being just four years older than I was at 25. But he had proven his efficacy enough to warrant a reasonable say in the matters. And Davy contemplated it for a moment before shrugging and walking off. I don't see why not. Grab Angus and let me know when it's ready, he responded. After drilling a sizable pocket to place the charge in and hammering around additional layers of rebar, the charge was set and everybody once more drove to a safe distance. As before, Angus received the green light and detonated it, with the thunderous crack of the material splitting, echoing throughout the cavern. We returned to the site and with all members of the crew now being aware of the strange anomaly, everybody crowded around the opening as the dust began to fully settle. To our immense surprise, the explosion didn't reveal additional layers of concrete, or even normal stone on the other side, but rather an opening into what appeared to be another cavern. Margo, having retrieved a lamp from one of the trucks, powered it on and shined it in the hole, only to reveal something even stranger. It was a warehouse. A sizable one at that, with various wooden crates and shelves, that extended well beyond the reach of the lamp's light. Now, just what in the hell did we come across here? Angus asked, approaching the opening. He motioned for Margo to hand in the lamp and after retrieving it, stepped inside the opening which was barely a foot above ground level. He shined the light around, revealing a ceiling of at least 20 feet in height and even more rows of shelves and crates extending throughout the room. Soon thereafter, another four of us grabbed a lamp as well and followed, entering the strange realm. Everything was covered in a noticeably thick layer of dust, the type that only accumulates after years upon years of abandonment. The air was visibly polluted with it, and after walking roughly a hundred feet deeper, we were forced to turn back due to the relatively unbreathable nature of the environment. However, before returning, our lamps were able to vaguely illuminate a door at the other end of the storage room. It was made of solid metal and had one of those wheel-like mechanisms for opening it. Something one might find inside of a ship. And Davy, being practically asthmatic after venturing inside, gestured to the nearest workers. Grab some respirators from the truck. I'd rather figure out what this is before we blow anything else to pieces, he ordered. The workers nodded and returned carrying a crate of them, with Davy distributing them out to each of the crew members before pointing to the opening. Need five people to check it out with me. It's not a sightseeing tour, we're detailing every last thing we find, and then we're heading back out to continue our work. Regardless, everyone mask up while the ventilation system does its job, he stated. I, being rather intrigued, immediately volunteered, as did Angus, Margot, Mark, and a rather newer individual by the name of Al. Once everybody had donned their gear, we once more entered the opening and began venturing to the other side. The many crates that we passed along the way were mostly unmarked, with some having labels that had become far too faded to perceive the information printed on them. While looking at the crates, I failed to notice that Mark had paused directly in front of me, and as a result, I nearly took both of us to the ground by accident. Shit, my fault, man. All good? I asked, regaining my footing. He briefly scanned the left side of the room through the scaffolded shelving before responding. Ah, no worries, could have sworn I saw some shit moving around, and that's it. He replied, seeming marginally uneasy. Angus briefly turned around and joined in as well before continuing onward. Ah, probably just a rat lad. Might even be a raccoon. Perhaps even the boogeyman, he added with a chuckle. No way in hell a raccoon's all the way down here. Doubt even a rat would bother, Al included. Well, it seems that only leaves the boogeyman then. Angus responded, releasing a hearty laugh. The conversation was abruptly cut short by a loud creaking further up ahead. Davy had reached the door at the other end and was attempting to open it to little avail. Mind cutting the banter and lending me a hand, he asked, annoyance clear in his voice. Angus rushed over and upon likewise grabbing the wheel managed to begin successfully turning it. It released an ear-splitting, grinding noise clearly indicative of the amount of time that had passed since it was last opened. 
Eventually, it came fully loose as the door slowly creaked open. The rest of us rushed over and upon shining our lights through the doorway discovered that the discovery was likely far more sizable than we had originally anticipated. A hallway extended to both the left and right of the doorway, with more doors and what appeared to be a mess hall at the furthest left end. Two other hallways extended from the main as well, both leading further into the structure. Older fluorescent lights lined the ceiling, but considering the clear age of the structure, chances of them working were evidently negligible. Should we like split up, or are we just going to search this place one room at a time? Mark questioned. And Davy considered it for a moment before responding. I would rather leave it to the survey crew to fully map this place. Check what you can and reconvene here in 20. Sound good? He replied. Everybody nodded as we began splitting up to check the structure. I went towards the mess hall as Angus began attempting to open the nearest door while everybody else went in their own directions. I reached the mess hall fairly quickly and discovered four rows of lunchroom style tables with a large box television mounted on the wall. A counter extended on the furthest wall leading into what appeared to be a kitchen. I hopped the counter knocking over a metal tray which hit the ground with an echoing crash. Margot, being nearby, called over. Everything all right over there, Finn? She asked. Having spooked myself to some degree, I composed myself before responding. Yeah, all good, just being clumsy is all, I replied. I made my way throughout the rather sizable industrial kitchen, coming across to various canned goods and cookware. Another door seemingly led out of the kitchen, but upon attempting to open it, I quickly concluded that it was locked up. The most striking aspect of the kitchen, however, was the seemingly used appearance of it. Not in the sense that it had been recently used, but rather used at some point. Multiple pots were found within a large sink basin with the mold growing within suggesting that they hadn't been unused when placed inside. Even some of the counters had visible residue underneath the profoundly thick layer of dust. Eventually, I glanced at my watch and realized that around 15 minutes had passed. I once more hopped the counter, this time being mindful of the remaining trays sitting on its surface. Before I could make my way into the hallway, however, I picked up a distinct sound from inside of the kitchen, particularly the sound of something small such as a metal utensil clattering against the ground. I quickly shined my lamp back over the counter and was met with a rather unnerving sight, a small pair of eyes looking back at me. Not in some overly unnatural sense, but rather something comparable to the eyes of an animal at night. Just two dimly reflective, almost shimmering dots. I froze and kept my light on the eyes. They were small enough to fit the profile of a medium-sized rodent. But the more alarming aspect was how they seemed directly behind the counter, yet still cleared the top of it. The counter being around three and a half feet off the ground made this especially concerning. I slowly backed away, keeping my light on the strange set of eyes as they remained unmoving and aimed in my direction. Once I was back in the hall, I quickened my pace and eventually made it back to the door that we had entered in, where Margot and Davy were waiting. Davy was flipping through a dusty folder of papers that he had evidently discovered while Margot was reviewing a binder that she had likewise come across as well. I'm glad to see you made it back. You find anything? Margot questioned. Uh, not really. Found a kitchen and a locked door. Nothing of much substance. I replied, pausing for a moment. I considered trying to explain the small creature that was evidently in the kitchen with me, but eventually I settled with a more rational explanation. Yeah, there was also a big-ass rat or something in there. It kind of freaked me out, I added. And Davy briefly looked up from his papers before returning to them once more. The place must be infested then. I came across a good few of them in the offices that I found. Would be lying if I said they didn't spook me as well, he added. Margot was seemingly about to add something as well before Angus and Mark likewise had arrived. Both were empty-handed, but Mark was clearly rather shaken up. Anything interesting? Davy questioned, still flipping through the stack of papers. I found another storage room with even more boxes. This lad walked right into a rat nest and nearly crapped his pants. 
He added, a lightly elbowing Mark on the shoulder. He seemed rather annoyed, but likewise joined in as well. I shined my light into a hallway and caught the eyes of about a dozen of the rodents. Looked like some shit straight out of a horror movie, he added. As he finished, a loud crash once more echoed through the kitchen at the other end of the hall. We each shined our lamps in that direction, only to be met by none other than the same eyes as before peeking around the corner. With the profound amount of dust in the air throughout the facility, it was still impossible to make out a definitive form to the animal, but the eyes were clearly a foot above the ground. We remained silent for a moment as us and the animal stared each other down. Eventually, the silence was broken by my watch alarm going off, signifying that the 20 minutes was up. The animal scurried away, making an audible noise while doing so as we all composed ourselves once more. Ah, spooky little things, Angus commented, looking down the other end of the hall. Say, have you lads seen Al around here? He added. We looked around, likewise taking notice of his absence. He had gone down the hallway at the furthest end and with each of us having a timekeeping device of some sort, it was more than expected that we would be back at the end of those 20 minutes. Davy seemed rather frustrated and placed the stack of papers in his jacket as he walked over to the entrance of the hall. He called out multiple times to no response and eventually started returning as his lamp began to visibly dim and flicker. Once back with the group, he removed and replaced the battery to no avail as the lamp proceeded to fully extinguish itself. He shook his head before addressing the group. Uh, nothing but more rats and more dust, and I'm sure as hell not about to go down there with this piece of shit. He added, hitting the defunct lamp. Eh, uh, I'll go get the lad, Angus commented, as he made his way towards the hall. He eventually disappeared around the corner as the echoing sound of his footsteps gradually faded, eventually becoming inaudible. Davy gestured towards Margot's lamp which she had handed to him. Yeah, you three head back, I'll wait for him. He stated, shining the light down the hall. A radio doesn't seem to be working all that well here. Get a unit at sight and relay your findings to the surface until we get back, he added. We simply nodded in unison and began making our way back through the warehouse. The atmosphere had noticeably shifted, and unease was becoming evident in each of our mannerisms. While I kept my light aimed straight ahead, Mark was shining his to either side, clearly still on edge due to his encounter within the facility. Margo, not having a lamp anymore, stayed closed by at the front of the group, eventually breaking the silence. Say, do y'all really think those are rats? She questioned. Mark caught up with the group before joining him as well. I would like to think so. I mean, why would you ask? He responded. Margot seemed to gather her thoughts for a moment before answering his question. I found this small office and a couple were in there. All I could see was their eyes peeking from behind a desk. She had responded. Yeah, same with my encounter. Pretty creepy, Mark interjected. Margot once more seemed to collect her thoughts before replying. Well, it's just... She paused a moment before continuing. As I left the office to meet up at the entrance, I turned around and one of those sets of eyes was almost at the ceiling, she added. Mark and I turned to face her and noticed that she was visibly shaken up from the recollection. Once more, she continued... It's like to imagine that it was just in my mind playing tricks or something, but there was nothing at that height that a rodent could have been sitting on for that to make sense. It was all just a wall. And once I began approaching it with the lamp, it went right back down to the desk in an instant. She included. Mark and I glanced at each other but otherwise remained silent. Despite the surreal nature of that description, it evidently matched what each of us had experienced as well. We didn't directly mention it, but something about that structure wasn't right. It was a conclusion that each of us appeared to silently arrive at as we quickened our pace and exited from the opening. The other six members of the crew were eagerly waiting, as our arrival was met by multiple lights shining through the hole. They looked marginally on edge as well, but before either party could exchange information, the sound of thundering footsteps from within the facility grabbed our attention. 
We return the beams of our lamps to the opening, though we're unable to immediately spot anything due to the freshly disturbed dust, further limiting the visibility. Eventually, the footsteps were evidently originating from within the warehouse, as a shadow became visible. It was Davy in a degree of full sprint that was virtually impossible for somebody in that age bracket. Angus was soon behind, seeming to be clutching his arm. The light that Davy was holding had clearly stopped working, and Angus had very clearly abandoned his at some point. Upon exiting the opening, Davy immediately signaled in the direction of the trucks and barked orders between raspy brass. Load up the trucks, we're leaving, he ordered. Angus was soon behind and it became evident fairly quickly that he had been significantly injured. With a stream of blood seeping between the fingers clutching his arm and pooling at his feet. Aside from the blood loss, he was pale as a ghost and speechless with his eyes wide with shock. For someone of his stature, it was beyond abnormal to see him in such a state of abject horror. In fact, many of us genuinely assumed it was impossible. Without question, all of us sprinted towards the trucks, quickly loading them up and starting them as we left the site. Being a passenger in the vehicle with Davy, I turned to him and immediately noticed his expression being one of pure and unadulterated fear as well. What the hell happened in there? Where is Al at? I quietly asked, sensing the gravity of the situation. Davy shook his head and clutched the steering wheel even harder as he turned to me. Al is dead, Finn. Those weren't rats and whatever they are, they tore him to shreds. He silently replied before returning his eyes to the path before us. What was left of them we could barely even identify, he added, his voice shaking. The sound of tires on stone once more enveloped the air, as both I and the two other crew that had hopped in the passenger cab were unable to formulate a proper response. Eventually, we had reached an intersection with three narrow tunnels and Davy quickly turned into the one leading to the surface. Soon thereafter, however, Davy's radio crackled to life, with Margot's voice emerging from the device. We're missing a truck. They were following behind us, but they didn't make the turn. She commented, the urgency in her voice indicating that Angus had conveyed the situation to them as well. We looked in the rearview mirror and noticed that we were in fact one truck short. Despite four having left the site, there were now only three in the single file line of vehicles. Davy slammed the steering wheel and released a string of obscenities before turning the vehicle around. He rolled down the window and ordered that the remaining trucks stay put as we traversed the short distance back to the entrance of the tunnel. Upon arriving, we turned back towards the site, only to see a rather unwelcome sight. Half the length of the shaft was now submerged in complete darkness. The strings of lights illuminating the cavern walls and ceiling to the very end had evidently failed, with the portable work lights along the nearest half of the cavern being the only source of light. Even the ones nearest to the site had begun to flicker, with the large floodlights stationed along the wall, opposite to us, failing rather shortly upon our arrival. As within the facility, the remaining lights reflected off various sets of eyes at the edge of the darkness. Some at ground level and others seemingly 20 feet or more in the air. There seemed to be dozens of them, and as another set of work lights extinguished themselves, I could have almost sworn that more sets of eyes appeared. Aside from the occasional popping of the lights, it was eerily dead silent and most notably, the remaining truck wasn't anywhere in sight, having evidently broken down far beyond what was now the reach of light. Furthermore, nobody within that vehicle had been present in that facility, and meaning the full urgency of the situation was likely not understood by any of them. And Davy, likely realizing this, loudly called out to them, his voice cracking while doing so. Upon receiving no response, he yelled once more, his voice echoing across the cavern walls. Again, no response. For a moment, we sat in silence, awaiting any sign that the occupants of the truck were still there, 
only for more silence to follow. Eventually, more work lights popped with a line of darkness now becoming precariously close. Davy once more released a stream of obscenities before grabbing his lamp and rushing to the edge of the light, shining it across the cavern from left to right. The various sets of eyes seemed to avoid the light, shifting to remain outside of the direct beam, filling the air with an unnerving scuttling noise as they did. Eventually, the beam reflected off the white paint of a truck at the furthest wall of the cavern with the doors wide open. The light likewise reflected off a mound lying directly outside of the door, which to our horror we quickly identified as one of the reflective stripes on our high visibility work jackets. The jacket was evidently still attached to something solid, but the spacing between the visibility stripes indicated that it was no longer in a single piece. Nearly on cue, Davy's work lamp began flickering once more. He quickly took notice, and he sprinted back to the well-lit area as it extinguished itself. Without a word, we once more loaded into the vehicle and began making our way back through the narrow tunnel. However, just as we were approaching the remaining two trucks, ours began slowing down, eventually coming to a complete stop. Davy attempted to restart it but to no avail with a gauge on the dash indicating that the battery was supposedly dead. Without any hesitation, we exited the truck and sprinted to reconvene with the rest of the crew, each of them now outside of their vehicles as well. Mark, being in the last truck of the group, immediately noticed us returning without the three missing members of our crew, and he leaned against the side of the truck with his head in his hands. Angus was likewise standing nearby, and now had a blood-soaked t-shirt wrapped around his arm. Margot had the hood of one of the vehicles open, and eventually slammed it shut and cleared her feet. She made her way over to us, as did the rest of the crew, and shared further unfortunate news. Yeah, the battery on both trucks are completely drained. Tried to radio back to the surface, but the units aren't working either. She commented, the weight of the situation likewise becoming evident to those still somewhat unaware. Silence filled the air for a brief moment before the faint sound of another bulb popping drew our attention. We turned to face the entrance of the tunnel and noticed that the cavern outside of the entrance was now completely black. Similarly, the lights nearest to the entrance had begun to flicker, as were the ones directly above us. Davy quickly sprang into action and retrieved a folded piece of paper from the glove box of the nearest vehicle. After unfolding the large sheet on the hood, he scanned it with his finger before signaling the rest of us over. The paper before us was a map of the caverns with Davy pointing to a spot midway through the tunnel ahead of us. That's the closest rescue chamber. We can't hoof it all the way to the surface, but the chamber's sturdy and it has supplies. We should at least be able to wait it out in there and call for some help, he stated. Everyone unanimously agreed and we quickly retrieved functioning lamps from the back of the nearest truck before beginning to jog as a group through the tunnel. Angus was in the back of the group and I fell behind to run alongside him. His condition was noticeably quite rough, though adrenaline alone would almost certainly keep him going until we were relatively safe. Though I hesitated initially, I eventually implored as to what had happened within that facility. What the hell went down in there? I quietly asked between breaths. He was silent for a moment and then eventually answered. They got out, lad. Tore him limb from limb. He weakly replied, pausing for a moment. Ah, the room was full of them and I barely had a chance to back out of the doorway before my light died. He added, pausing for another moment as he grabbed his arm and winced in pain. Once the room went dark, something lunged at me, ripped a fat old chunk out of my arm. If Davy hadn't rushed over with his lamp, they would have got me too. He commented, once more going silent. I likewise went silent, returning my focus to the pathway ahead. For a while, nothing but the sound of echoing footsteps filled the air along with the faint popping of lights in the distance. 
After another five minutes of running, I checked behind us and noticed that the darkness had expanded well beyond the entrance of the tunnel. In fact, it nearly seemed to be keeping pace with us, as only around 200 feet of the tunnel was sufficiently lit behind us. And Davy checked behind us at around the same time and took notice of this, picking up his pace and he encouraged the rest of us to do the same. Hey, we're almost there, let's pick things up. He loudly stated. Exhaustion and an audible sense of fear were becoming evident in his voice, as it shook with each word. Knowing him quite well along with his generally blunt and unexpressive mannerisms, it was an unnerving thing to notice. The rest of the crew seemed to pick up on this as the collected pace had increased to a sprint. Eventually a sign became visible on the ceiling ahead, with an arrow pointing towards an opening in the right of the tunnel. Upon reaching it, we were greeted by a welcome sight. The reinforced steel chassis of the rescue chamber with a small light above the door, signifying that it was in complete working order. Without a second of hesitation, Davy and Margot reached the heavy door and collectively opened it. One by one, the remaining crew filed inside, taking a seat on the long benches on either side of the capsule. I followed, as did Davy and Margo once everybody was inside. Upon closing and securing the heavy door, Davy likewise collapsed onto the bench, placing his face in his hands and going silent. For ten minutes, nobody spoke a word. The chamber was cramped and any noise would noticeably echo within, but nothing aside from our bated breaths could be heard. Eventually, the unwelcome sound of bulbs shattering became faintly audible through the door, initially seeming a slight distance away only to soon be fairly close. As the sound began to reach the tunnel directly outside the door, Margot silently stood up, verifying that the door was probably secured before once more sitting down. The sound of bulbs shattering passed by the outside of the door, and then slowly faded as it continued through the remaining stretch of the tunnel. The overhead light within the chamber began to flicker and then subsequently dimmed, though it remained on. Shortly thereafter, another sound became very faintly audible. The sound of something hard, such as nails lightly scratching and tapping on the outside of the chamber. It started out relatively unnoticeable, but quickly escalated in both frequency and volume until it was all that could be heard. It came from the walls, doors, and ceiling and echoed throughout the inside of the chamber at a deafening frequency. Angus covered his ears and began sobbing, while the remaining crew was very visibly barely keeping it together. To our delight, however, the light remained functional despite having dimmed by a large margin. In fact, most of the remaining electronics within the chamber appeared at least slightly functional, something likely permitted due to the immensely thick steel construction of the exterior. After around half an hour, the sound faded and silence once more filled the room. After a moment, Davy quietly stood up and began tinkering with the radio, with it thankfully still functioning and allowing connectivity with the surface. Upon explaining the situation, management informed us that a rescue team would be en route shortly, but was currently delayed due to a site-wide equipment problem. Explanations of the things down here with us fell on deaf ears, as the individual's surface side simply attributed our accounts to oxygen deprivation-induced hallucinations and suggested that we activate the chamber air supply. No amount of convincing from the rest of the crew could change their mind and we eventually had to simply concede and hope for the best, both for our safety and that of the individuals being sent to rescue us. Conclusively, that brings us to the present as I write this. Multiple tablets were discovered in a supply locker connected to the company Extranet, with a thankfully significant amount of power still contained in each. Each crew member took turns contacting loved ones along with informing the families of those who perished of their fate. Once I had done the same, I took it upon myself to construct this account in order to spread awareness of the events that transpired today. And we've been in this rescue chamber for well over five hours at this point and there hasn't been any additional word from the rescue team or the service. 
And we're trying to conserve as much battery power as possible, so I'll go ahead and end this here. I'll attempt to upload this in various areas online to get maximum coverage, but the extra net is painfully slow so it could take a while for anything to post. If there are any major updates or we somehow make it out, I'll provide additional updates as necessary. If you've happened to come across this, thank you for reading and listening, and wish us luck. We're clearly going to need it.